Front Toward Enemy Vietnam Firefights is a two-player Vietnam War tactical game, pitting a U.S. infantry company against forces of the North Vietnamese Army or the Viet Cong through a series of missions in rural Vietnam. Each turn represents about five minutes of real time and each hex approximately 50 meters across. There are 10 scenarios, each ranging in duration from one to three hours. The game includes two 22 by 34 inch map sheets, four sheets of five eighth of an inch counters, five scenario cards printed on both sides, two identical player aid cards, and one additional player aid card. Also, one 10-sided and one 6-sided die. And finally, one 24-page full-color rulebook. The map shows terrain, which is typical of the Vietnamese countryside. Each hex has a center dot used to trace line of sight. And the dot's color also denotes the terrain type. A white dot is used for clear terrain, a green dot for grass, a dark green dot means jungle, and a light green dot denotes rice paddies. And finally, a brown dot means a hamlet is in the hex. Unit counters represent infantry units such as fire teams, weapons teams, and leaders. And there are also counters for civilians, vehicles, and helicopters. The numbers on the unit counters show the unit's fire rating and range, as well as the unit's troop quality rating. This rating represents the highest die roll with a 10-sided die to successfully accomplish certain actions in the game that require such troop quality check. The backside of certain units show a white stripe across the unit type, which indicates that the unit is at reduced strength. All units are divided into one of three movement classes, infantry, vehicle, and helicopter. And the terrain cost for each class differs by terrain type, as shown in the terrain effects chart. The color of the box around a unit's fire rating denotes its weapons class. Red means small arms, yellow high explosives, and white dual purpose. A green box around the troop quality rating indicates that the unit is a leader. Some units, like vehicles and helicopters, have a defensive modifier printed on the counter. The number of soldiers shown on a combat unit counter refers to the number of troops, and this is important for purposes of transport capacity. The terrain effects chart contains information of the cost in movement points to enter each terrain type, and it also lists the fire modifiers that apply when firing at units in certain terrain types. In this game, units may be concealed or visible and concealment provides a favorable die roll modifier to units when fired upon, and also a favorable die roll modifier when such concealed units conduct opportunity fire. Victory points are awarded for many reasons, and these are summarized on the victory point chart. And these are inflicting killed in action and wounded in action results on enemy units capturing enemy WIA units, evacuating friendly WIA units, shooting helicopters down, immobilizing or destroying vehicles, and destroying catchers, bunkers, or tunnels. And in this game, the side with the most victory points at the end of the game wins, and in the event of a tie, the NVA slash VC player wins. For each turn in a scenario, the players perform the following sequence of play. In the reinforcement phase, players enter reinforcements on the map edges as specified in the scenario instructions. Next is the activation phase, and this is the heart of the game. 
The scenario will state which side starts as the active player, allowing that player to perform an activation. All remaining activations are determined by pulling a chit from an opaque cup, and the chit will state whether a side conducts the next activation or whether a random event occurs. And activation complete markers are placed on units that are so activated. In the next phase, players execute fire missions that had been successfully requested in the preceding activation phase. In the check casualties phase, players check to see if WIA units become KIA. In the check for concealment phase, players determine whether any non-concealed units may obtain concealment status. In the end of turn phase, activation complete markers are removed from the units and the turn marker is advanced, and if this was the last turn of the game, victory is determined. The game uses a random activation engine where players activate units and leaders to perform certain actions. Generally, for each activation, a player will pull an activation chit from an opaque container. The chit drawn may trigger a random event, or it may show which player may perform an activation. Each activation chit can be used to activate a leader and all of the units within his 2 hex command range, or to activate all the units in a hex, or to activate a single unit. A player may also pass on his activation, at which time the next chit is pulled. Activated infantry units may perform one of the following actions. They may perform a move action, paying movement points as stated in the terrain effects chart to enter each hex or cross certain hex sides. Units that move may be subject to enemy opportunity fire if the enemy units pass a troop quality check. Continuing with the actions, units may conduct a fire action to fire individually or combine with other activated units to target an enemy unit within range. Vehicles and infantry units that start their actions adjacent to an enemy unit may be activated for an assault action. An infantry unit in a hex with a hidden catch including tunnels, foxholes, and bunkers, may conduct a search action to see if the unit locates such catch. A unit activated for a recovery action may remove an exhausted marker, remove a suppressed marker, or convert a broken marker to a suppressed marker, or remove a low ammunition marker. An American infantry unit may be activated to destroy a previously located catch. An American leader may request a medevac in order to evacuate MIA and KIA markers from the battlefield, and this awards the Americans with victory points. An American or NVA leader or a forward observer may be activated for a request a fire mission. Vehicles and helicopters may perform two actions each time they are activated. For vehicles, the two actions must be different, and for helicopters, at least one of them must be a move action. Vehicles and helicopters may load and unload infantry units that they are transporting. Now let's take a look at some examples of play. Let's take a look at this activation example. In this situation, an American activation chit has just been drawn, and the American player has various options as to which units he activates. He could activate the leader in hex 2323. By doing so, he would activate the leader, which may in turn activate the two fire teams in hexes 2222 and 2223, and the broken leader in 2322. The machine gun team in 2123 would not be activated because it is already under an activation complete marker. 
the two units in 2024 would not be activated with the leader because they are more than two hexes away from the leader. They are outside the leader's two hex command range. The other option would be that the American player could activate the broken leader in 2322 only, and only he would be activated as he is broken. Another option would be that the American player could activate the two units in 2024, and this would not activate any other units for this activation. And finally, the last option is that the American player could choose to activate the vehicle in hex 2324, which would activate on its own. Let's take a look at this movement example. In this situation, the unit in hex 1917 moves into 1918. For a cost of one movement point, as it is able to use the trail movement cost instead of the jungle movement cost, which would have been two movement points. It then can enter 1919 for one movement point, again using the trail, and finally into 2019. The movement into 2019 costs three movement points, that is one for using the trail, plus two for the slope. And at this point the unit has used all five movement points, in which case we would place an activation complete marker on the unit. Now the unit in 2117 is not on a trail hex, and it will have to pay the full movement cost to enter another hex. So in order to get to hex 2320, the player declares that it will use double time movement, and this increases the number of movement points it has from 5 to 9, but an exhausted marker will be placed on the unit at the end of the activation. The unit moves to hex 2217, spending four movement points, that is two to enter a jungle hex and plus two for the slope. And from there into hex 2318 for one and a half movement points. It then moves into hex 2319, also at a cost of one and a half movement points. And finally into hex 2320, at a cost of one movement point, and at this point the unit has spent eight of its nine movement points. It could move into hex 2220 for one movement point, but it could not move into hex 2321 as this would cost one and a half movement points. So at the end of its move, because it double timed, it would receive an exhausted marker as well as an activation complete marker. Let's take a look at this fire example. In this situation the American leader has been activated and he activates the two American units, that is the fire team and the mortar unit that are within his two hex command range to perform a fire action and there are several ways that the fire action can be performed. Both units could attack separately. The fire team would normally need to roll four or less to hit. It has a fire rating of four, but in this case there's a plus two die roll modifier because the defender is in the jungle and a minus one because the attacker is adjacent. So that is a total net die roll modifier of plus one. So the fire team would have to roll three or less to hit. The mortar team would also need to roll a three or less to hit. Notice it has a fire rating of four, but uh, there is no modifier for the jungle hex because uh, this unit is firing high explosives. There is, however, a plus one die roll modifier because the mortar team is using a friendly leader as an observer. Another option is for both units to combine their fire into a single attack. If the fire team is the primary firing unit, the to hit roll becomes a 4, and that is because there would be an additional minus 1 die roll modifier for the mortar supporting the fire action. 
Now, if the mortar is the primary firing unit, the two-hit roll is again a four, and that's because there would be an additional minus one die roll modifier for the fire team now supporting the fire action. So here the Americans choose the first option, to make two fire attacks. First, the Americans fire with the fire team. And the roll is a 5, which is a miss. Now the Americans roll for the mortar. The roll is a 3, which is a hit. And now the Americans roll again for the effect. And we roll 1d10 on the target effects table, specifically on the H, E, or yellow column. And the roll is a 1, a killed in action result. So the NVA unit is flipped to its reduced side, and a KIA marker is placed on the NVA unit. And the American units are all marked with activation complete markers. The final situation, as shown here, is that the American player, because of the KIA result, gains three victory points. Let's take a look now at an assault example. Here the American leader has been activated and he activates the two American units, that is the two fire teams that are adjacent to the North Vietnamese Army concealed unit. The fire team in Hex 2219 cannot assault because it is not adjacent to any enemy unit. The American leader will not participate in the assault, just the two fire teams. The advantage of including the leader is that no troop quality check would be needed for the fire team that is stacked with the leader. However, leaders are very tempting targets during an assault for their defenders. If the American units were concealed, they would lose their concealment markers at this time. The NVA unit has some options. It can declare opportunity fire if it wishes against one of the assaulting units, but this would cause the unit to lose its concealment status. So the NVA unit decides not to perform opportunity fire and remains concealed. Now, each of the American units must pass a troop quality check in order to participate in the assault. And they each need to roll a 4 or lower. And you see that each one has a troop quality rating of 4, which is the 4 in the white box on the top right corner of the counter. The fire team in 2020 rolls a 1 and passes the troop quality check. And the fire team in 1919 also rolls a 1 and also passes. So now we go to the first round of fire combat in this assault. The American units can combine their attack into a single attack or they can attack separately. And they decide to combine their attacks. The fire team in Hex 2020 is identified as the primary firing unit. Its fire rating is 4 but there's a plus two total die roll modifier, and that is plus two for the defender's jungle terrain, plus two for the defender being concealed, minus one for firing at an adjacent unit, and minus one for a supporting unit, which is the other American fire team. For a hit, the American player has to roll a modified die roll of four or less. The roll is a 5 modified to a 7, and this is a miss. Now the NVA unit decides to fire at the American unit in Hex 1919, and this unit gets no terrain modifier for this round, but will get the terrain modifier for later rounds. The fire rating of the North Vietnamese unit is a 4, with a minus 1 die roll modifier for firing at an adjacent enemy unit. The NVA unit rolls a 2, which is now modified to a 1, and that is a hit. And now the NVA player rolls on the target effects table to determine the effect of the hit, and we use the small arms or red column. 
and the roll is a 5, and this is a broken result. And this result breaks the fire team. So we place a broken marker on the American fire team, and it retreats to hexes. If the NVA unit would have had line of sight into the hexes through which the broken unit retreated, it could have made opportunity fire attempts at the broken unit, but it doesn't have a line of sight to any of those two hexes. So at the end of the first round, the defending unit loses its concealed marker. And even if the American player would want to call off the assault now, he is not able to do so, and the assault must continue. So now we go to the second round, and the American unit needs a 3 to hit. It is a 4 fire rating with a plus 2 die roll modifier for jungle terrain, where the defender is. Minus 1 for firing in an adjacent enemy unit. The roll is a 10, and this game a 0 is always a 10, and a 10 is always an automatic miss. Now the NVA unit fires and it needs a 5 to hit, that is, it's 4 fire rating, minus 1 for firing in an adjacent enemy unit. But it rolls a 6, and this is a miss. So now we go to the third and final round of uh, combat here in this assault example. And the rolls needed to hit are the same. So the Americans fire first, the fire team rolls a 2, and this is a hit. So now the Americans roll on the target effects table under the small arms column, and the roll is an 8. The result is suppression, and this result is applied after the NVA unit fires back. So now we roll for the NVA unit. It rolls a 2, which is also a hit. So it rolls a die also on the small arms column of the target effects table. And the result is a 9, a possible suppression. That means that the American fire team will be suppressed if it fails a troop quality check. The American uh, unit has a troop quality rating of 4. The roll is a 3. It passes the check, so it is not suppressed. So, at the end of this third round, the assault automatically ends, the NVA unit is suppressed, the American unit that was in Hex 1919 is broken and has retreated to Hexes, and the American unit in Hex 2020 remains in its Hex, and it is marked with an Activation Complete Marker. This is Front Toward Enemy, designed by Joe Chacon, and published by Multiman Publishing. I hope this video has given you an idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe, signing off for now. Thanks for watching.